Good afternoon. Uh, here we are convening for the last uh, session of this uh, very enjoyable conference uh, between intellectuals and academics uh, from the Arab world and from Russia. And uh, the title of the last uh, session of the last uh, panel is the Russian policy in the Arab Maghreb and the Horn of Africa. You can notice that it is a highly African uh, uh, panel between uh, the Russian uh, policy in the north and the east of Africa. During this uh, panel, four panelists will uh, talk. Dr. Abdurrahim Latawi, Dr. Qasim al Hadig, Dr. Abdul Hai Ali Qasim Saleh, and Dr. Muhammad Ahmed Sheikh Ali. In the beginning, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Abdul Rahim Al Atawi to talk about Russia and Morocco, statistics, and dynamics. Uh, Dr. Abdul Rahim Latawi, he is a professor of the Russian language and literature. Uh, uh, Natawi served as the head of the Department of Russian Language and Literature and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the University of Muhammad V in Rabat, in Morocco, 1967. He holds a doctorate of the state uh, from the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, Hassan II University, Ein Shok, Casablanca, for his 1993 dissertation on the theme Russian Orientalism and Arabic Islamic Studies in Russia. Dr. Abdul Rahim Latawi has written several literature about Russia, notably the dissertation on the theme Russian Orientalism and Arabic and Islamic Studies to introduce the Orientalists in Russia and the Russian production throughout the Islamic Arab world. Among his uh, recent publications is his book about the uh, relationship with Morocco, between Morocco and Russia. And it has, uh, during this uh, book, uh, or in his book, he published several documentations, uh, several documents uh, from Russian translated into Arabic from the archives of the state of Russia. 15 minutes, Dr. Latawi, to talk about Morocco and Russia, stat statics and dynamics. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I try to uh, be concise. My first uh, intervention, I knew that I have 15 minutes, so I did a second summary. And before coming in, I did a third summary. So I will try to uh, respect the 15 minutes. Before tackling the core issue, it is important to remind that uh, there is a trend towards Orientalism for the Russian people. And it is good to remember that uh, the first historian who wrote about uh, the Russian people and other tribes uh, was Muhammad Faman, the envoy to the king of Bulgaria. So Russia is an oriental country. And the Russian people has always been people living according to an oriental lifestyle. Up until the arrival of uh, Peter I, uh, who changed the face of Russia and 
imposed upon people to change uh, their lifestyle to a Western European one. I'd like to move to the relationship between Morocco and Russia, old Russia. Regarding this topic, we can say that Russia has been interested in the region of North Africa since the 18th century, and it has been continuous, and there are several documents to prove this interest. Up until the last quarter of the 18th century, when Muhammad bin Abdullah, the Sultan of Morocco, decided to open the ports of Morocco for European foreign ships. And when Russia knew about this new policy, there was a dispute between the Moroccan officials and the Russians in a city. So some Russian ships in 1787 or 78 visited the city of Tanja. And then there were some uh, correspondence between the Moroccan leader and uh, the uh, leader of Russia back then, Catherine II. These documents are still preserved in the Russian archives, particularly in Moscow and St. Petersburg. This correspondence came to an end came to an end because of interventions of the Ottoman Empire that was in constant uh, war with the Russian Empire. In 1894, the government of the Emperor of Russia recognized uh, the King of Morocco and decided to open a general consulate in Tanja. And uh, this, uh, that was how the consulate was uh, appointed. Uh, the, consul, uh, the consulate was opened and uh, it remained uh, in operation until 1912 before the French protectorate and the Spanish uh, protectorate. And uh, it has become a um, diplomatic office until 1917, date of the fall of the Russian Empire and uh, the victory of the Bolshevist uh, Revolution. And the nineteen twenties, the uh, interest of the newborn uh, Soviet state in Morocco was based on the war of liberation fought in the north of Morocco, or of the Maghreb, uh, led by Muhammad bin Abdul Karim al-Khattabi. The Soviet Union supported this movement from 1921 till 1926. There was a media campaign uh, with the participation of uh, several political parties in the western uh, in western europe uh, particularly the french communist party starting 1924 this campaign 
started to decline. And in 1924, indeed, France recognized the new state, uh, the Soviet Union. A lot of historians said that this campaign imposed on France to recognize the Soviet Union, and this is how it declined when the recognition took, took place. Let us move to the uh, Maghreb uh, in the 50s. The Soviet Union used to defend the independence of uh, Morocco. Uh, the international uh, level, notably the General Assembly of the United Nations, and uh, the Soviet Union always supported an independent Morocco. The Soviet Union was among the first countries to recognize uh, uh, the independence of Morocco. In 1958, the two countries kick-started diplomatic ties and exchanged ambassadors. This step can be considered as a, a continuation of uh, their relationship uh, that started in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Despite the huge gap between the two political, economic, and social systems and regimes in the two countries, the ties, since their very beginning, were based on mutual respect and non-intervention in internal affairs. And uh, the visits prove, the mutual visits prove uh, this uh, concept uh, and strengthened uh, these, uh, uh, th this relationship. In the 1960s, a Russian leader visited King Hassan uh, II, and uh, King Hassan II visited the Soviet Union. Regarding the trade exchange, Morocco used to export some minerals, particularly phosphate and uh, vegetables, as to the imports uh, from the Soviet Union was about uh, machinery, uh, agricultural machinery, and uh, other energy products. The ties grew bigger and, bi and stronger, and several major projects were executed, and Russia has become, or Russia became, an important market for the Moroccan products. It is important to mention a number of achievements accomplished by Morocco, the thermal energy in 1991, the hydroelectric uh, uh, power in 1972, Dara, another hydroelectric uh, plant in 1974, and also a third hydroelectric project, and several other mega projects. Among the valuable aid provided by the Soviet Union in the context of the scientific uh, support receive, was receiving uh, since the 60s a lot of Moroccan students who lived in Russia among the Russian people and studied for free in Russian institutes and colleges. Morocco and the Federal State of Russia, the uh, ties became even stronger. Let us move to the political uh, relationship between uh, Morocco and uh, uh, the Soviet Union and Russia. We can uh, notice that uh, the ties uh, with the Soviet Union in the past and Russia later were productive and positive. Since the independence of Morocco, these uh, relationships have been 
growing bigger and stronger and they were based on as i have said mutual respect and the uh, soviet union uh, the leader of the socialist uh, movement in the world never tried to intervene in the internal affairs of morocco and um, the soviet union did not take any clear position regarding the uh, uh, dismantling of the Communist Party in Morocco in the 60s, although the communists of the world were against uh, this uh, decision, and uh, the media in Russia was against uh, this decision. The Moroccan Communist Party was back into politics after changing its name twice. The embassy of uh, the Soviet Union uh, tried uh, in public uh, not to spread the communist uh, politi po policy. The pragmatic approach, however, included some ambiguous uh, ideology, particularly in uh, uh, at the level of uh, uh, culture. The Soviet uh, Cultural Institute used to distribute poetry and literature about the communist uh, ideology written by authors and poets who were employed, most of them were employed by the uh, ruling Soviet party. Pasternak, Akhmatovot, and other writers, their uh, literature was not uh, mentioned and uh, the youth m Moroccan uh, movements uh, used to have some actions, uh, so some activities uh, leading Marx, Lenin, and other communist philosophers and theorists, in addition to documentaries about the happy life, of course, uh, between brackets, about uh, the happy uh, people in the paradise of the Soviet Union. These uh, were not uh, threats uh, to the Moroccan uh, state because uh, the communist literature used to be taught in the University of Morocco and in the high schools in Morocco, similarly to other philosophies. There were several crises. And all these crises were because of the position of the Soviet Union vis-à-vis -vis the uh, Sahara. The Soviet Union uh, was supportive of the Algerian requests in the beginning, and. Uh, it was about or it jeopardized the relationship with Morocco. However, the Soviet Union changed its uh, position. And with um, uh, the uh, birth of the federal state, or the Russian Federation. The new Russia started uh, to take neutral positions uh, from 2002 until now we can see this. Uh, King uh, Mohammed uh, VI visited uh, Russia in 2002 to sign a strategic cooperation agreement. In the recent years, Russia moved from its neutral position to according uh, to the Russian ambassador to Rabat to this positive uh, neutrality backing Morocco in the recent uh, years. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Abdurrahim Al Attawi. Uh, who told us about, uh, shed light about the relationship between uh, Russia and Morocco. Uh, historical overview, the 18th century, the Ottoman presence in the Mediterranean uh, region, and um, the Russians were also present in Morocco in the late 19th century during the uh, big conflict uh, between the imperial regimes uh, in Morocco, Russia has always been neutral and was never or has never taken part in this uh, conflict in Morocco. And uh, did not uh, seek its share of the pie. We can also uh, uh, talk about uh, the support of Russia, of the liberation movement, and uh, Mohammed Abdul Karim Al Khattabi in the reef, uh, on the reef of Morocco, and uh, it uh, is in line with the general policy of the Soviet Union vis-à-vis -vis liberation movements. There was also, uh, or. Uh, Mr. Latawi shed light uh, on the economic uh, presence of the Russians in Morocco and the mega projects uh, implemented by the Russians, particularly dams. Uh, we noticed the total silence of the Russians uh, regarding the uh, dismantling of the Communist Party in Morocco. I think we should examine and study uh, the reasons behind the Russian silence vis-à-vis -vis this uh, issue. And uh, Mr. Latawi also mentioned the crisis and uh, uh, the Sahara and the positive neutrality. Recently, at this level, Russia is uh, supporting the United Nations decision at this level, it's a positive, neutral position at the international level. We move to another topic, always in the Maghreb, and Mr. Qasim al Hadek will be talking about fixed and changing variables in Russian policy towards North Africa, the cases of Algeria and uh, Morocco. Mr. Qasim al Hadek. Uh, is uh, one of our uh, dear uh, friends um, who always attends uh, uh, these conferences. Uh, he's a research professor in modern history. He is interested in the fields of modern and current history and international relations. He has participated in a number of national and international seminars and has published a range of peer-reviewed studies uh, and articles. He received his doctorate from Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah University in Fez. Mr. Kassim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, the chair and also to the center as well of studies for allowing me this opportunity. Uh, people, f observers of the relations between Russia and North Africa after the Cold War will have noticed uh, an important development, um, the, the features of which and the strategy became very clear after the advent of Vladimir Putin to power. And uh, that's what we heard in the previous session. And also building the Russian structures and Russia regaining some of its standing at the, on the, in, the, in the international arena. Uh, the relation, the Russian-Moroccan relations, um, witnessed a turning point which brought Russia back to the uh, the North African uh, Moroccan region after some absence. Uh, the, thereby, Russia uh, could rebuild its relations with the countries of the region, for most of which its um, traditional ally, Algeria, and new partners as well, which had not been partners before, namely Morocco. And Russia in the region, in North Africa, had uh, real interests uh, which it defends and tries to preserve and strengthen them. 
However, what is new about this return um, of Russia to the region is that the Russian foreign policy came with new techniques different from the counterparts in the Soviet era. The Russian foreign policy returned to the region with the uh, uh, means based on um, uh, interests uh, after it was based before on political principles and ideological principles. Therefore, there were the features of uh, Putin's policy in the region uh, where Russia ad abandoned its ideology and started instead to focus on mutual interests with the countries of the region. From this departure point, this paper tries to address a number of questions which re related to the um, the fixed and changing variables in Russian policy towards North Africa by giving an overview of the history of the relations between Russia and the countries of the region, given that the history would actually cast uh, light on the presence. So, and this will determine the determinants of the Russian policy cannot be identified without looking at the historical role played by Russia and looking at the current situation and the prospects of the future. This uh, previous paper helped me also by uh, tackling this issue and also look at the determinants and the directions of the Russian foreign policy in general and its impact on the North Africa region and the motivations behind the Russian interest in the region. Uh, what the real interests for the Russians in the area. And then we'll talk about details about the relations between Russia and Morocco and Algeria as two independent cases and whether the ideological component is still uh, in play in this kind of relation. The Soviet Union and the North Africa during the uh, Cold War as well. Uh, we'll be talking about it. And during the uh, ideology played an important role during the Soviet Union in determining the directions of the Soviet foreign policy. And this ideological factor will became the main determinant for about half a century. As for the um, Moroccan countries, uh, North African countries, after the Maghreb countries, after their independence, and the uh, receding power uh, of the Western powers like uh, France, the, there was still competition in the region between the powers, but with this change that the U.S. and the Soviet Union replaced the former uh, Western powers, European powers. That's why the region show uh, witnessed uh, ideological polarization, which showed that the uh, attraction or tension between the two camps where Algeria and Libya uh, tended to go in the uh, socialist camp while uh, Morocco uh, turned to the western camp. And with this polarization, the Algerian uh, Soviet relations uh, became very strong, which was reflected in a number of areas. Um, for example, the role of the Russian experts in the in the Algerian industry, building installations and structures, con Russian contribution to the Algerian economy, and the also building the pipelines, oil pipelines, and the, and uh, thousands of Algerian students um, being exchanged with the Soviet universities. In comparison with what we heard in the previous paper, the relation continued during the Moroccan struggle for independence and continued even after dependence, but this relation remained ordinary uh, to a large extent on the number of variations, the number of positions vis-a-vis -a, -vis a number of issues. And now we talk about the strength of the algerian russian soviet relations. Second, what are the determining factors and the directions of the Russian foreign policy in North Africa at the time during uh, the reign of uh, Putin? The policies in the region witnessed a transformation after Putin came to power uh, uh, 1999, which was represented in restructuring and redrawing the priorities of Russian foreign policy in the region, which 
is commonly called Russian foreign policy. This policy retained a number of principles and changed some directions and other principles. In the past, Russia dealt with the countries of the region, now, uh, which was based on ideological considerations, uh, dominating over other factors like the strategic and the economic and the political. The Russian uh, policy since the breakdown of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, restructuring process, uh, whereby it became more pragmatic and utilitarian and it sought to achieve a national uh, interests for Russia in the region. And uh, on the basis of these directions and determinants, uh, Russia managed to restructure its relation with the countries of the region uh, uh, and using a uh, basis of new foundations, uh, economic and strategic, and abandoning, totally abandoning the, uh, the policy adopted during the Soviet era, which divided the region into re recessive and progressive countries. Third, what are the interests of uh, the uh, Russian Federation in the region? What are the motivations behind Putin's interest in the uh, North African region? First of all, it sh should be noted that the uh, region of North Africa uh, it was in the front, was only a small stone in the uh, and actually uh, rather a pawn in the uh, board chess board uh, for the Russians uh, because the um, less low significance of that region for the Russian foreign policy but start also try to be present uh, prominent uh, have a prominent presence in the region for a number of considerations for most among which the pursuit or they trying to regain areas of influence uh, the Russians lost during the Soviet uh, era, especially in North Africa. In addition, its pursuit or its attempt to create uh, some sort of balance in the relations with the U.S. Uh, in trying to establish a, a multipolar uh, polar, um, system. And the interests have of Russian interest in the region, three sectors, first of which is the uh, energy sector, which requires cooperation, coordination with the, run, with the area countries of the region, one of the main priorities of the Russian foreign policy. And uh, the most prominent of uh, area, uh, the country that witnessed this kind of relation is Algeria, but the energy policy and the coordination uh, between uh, Russia and Algeria uh, has certain political objectives, primarily not economic. The um, primarily political, namely the uh, having uh, 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 surrounding Europe uh, with a with a like a what seems to be like a a belt or a, a girdle, uh, where with Russian influence, and the second sector, which also uh, which is important, the area of uh, weapons and um, the military uh, weapons. Uh, 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 treaties. Uh, Russia tries to promote its weapons and to the region, not for ideological considerations, as was the case in the Soviet era, but because these uh, weapons constitute an important element of the Russian treasury, and Russia benefited a lot from the tension, of the tense relations between the uh, Morocco and Algeria, and the competition witnessed by those two countries in the purchase of uh, munitions and weapons, uh, and which is very important for uh, in the domestic, national domestic product. The third point, uh, the Russian-Algerian relations vis-a-vis uh, the ideological coalition to a strategic partnership. Algeria continued since the years of independence, became the major ally for Russia in the Maghribi region, and the end of the Cold War did not change this kind of strong relation in any fashion. If the Algerian-Russian relations witnessed some uh, uh, decrease or decline uh, some time, but it kept the same at the same level in the political sense, and this was clearly manifested in the agreement and the uh, of a convergence of viewpoints between the two countries vis-a-vis -a, -vis a number of regional issues. For example, the Libyan issue, the Syrian, Yemen. Many crises where we see uh, the uh, Algerian diplomacy 
is to a large extent very close to the Russian positions. The uh, announcement of strategic partnership between the countries 2001 was indeed the first partnership agreement signed by Russia with an African and Arab country. This agreement came to give a new impetus to the relations and the bilateral relations where Algeria is considered by Russia an essential partner in the Mediterranean area and North Africa. And however, the the cooperation, Russian cooperation, uh, was declined, uh, although it kept its political um, pace. And also the uh, intensification of economic uh, and military cooperation between Russia and Algeria, and the attempt to rebuild the bring the relations back to their normal previous level within the Russian pursuit to regain the areas of influence it had lost. As for Algeria, Algeria is seeking to play on the national international contradictions and the remnants of the Russian American conflict to uh, regain the mental image it had during the Cold War years. And in the military and technological field, there was actually uh, the relation witnessed a, an increase, especially the two uh, countries are uh, uh, having the um, Russian equipment which needs modernization and upgrading, which would impose signing an agreement between the two countries and arms deals between them. Finally, the dimensions and the limits of the uh, relation between Russia and the Maghreb region. The relation between Russia and Maghreb region witnessed an uh, important push, the strategic agreement uh, between the two uh, uh, parties that we saw, for instance, after the signing of the uh, Algerian-Russian partnership agreement, there was a similar one between Russia and Morocco, uh, perhaps after the visit of the royal monarch, of the uh, Moroccan monarch to uh, Russia, which actually opened a new stage for the relation between the two countries and the partnership in various areas with the political, uh, uh, commercial, and uh, strategic dimensions. The relation between the countries witnessed a noticeable progress, which moved uh, $640 million uh, uh, to uh, $2 billion, which makes Morocco in the forefront of the trade partners uh, for Russia and the Arab region as a whole. And North Africa as well. In the military area as well, the there is uh, the relation, there have been long-term relations between the two countries, which was represented by two uh, web arms deals 2012-2013, uh, although the, the the secrecy that with which these agreements were shrouded, although Morocco actually gains its uh, military equipment in a traditional uh, method from the allied countries, uh, the Western uh, 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 allies, but Russia is seeking as well to break this kind of Western monopoly in the military trade. As for Morocco, this actually openness to Russia comes in the method approached by Morocco in the foreign policy, which uh, opening new areas of cooperation and in addition to the relations with traditional partners and achieving a certain kind of balance in foreign relations with the partnership association agreement with Europe and others. And finally, if you allow me, please. The uh, Putin's effort to openness for uh, Maghreb or uh, Morocco and the efforts by Morocco to enhance relations with Russia, even though, in spite of that, the relations have not witnessed the uh, desirable progress due to a number of obstacles, for most among which uh, that Mor Morocco recognizes how difficult it is to uh, have complete openness with Russia in a way that will anger perhaps the traditional allies, uh, given the tension between West and Russia for a number of regional issues, and also uh, including Ukraine. And the Morocco realizes that the kind of step, this kind of step, and I apologize for taking a long time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Perhaps the key word to read the relations uh, between the Morocco uh, and Russia is the economic uh, uh, and the strategic interest, whether the Soviet era or in the Russian state, and perhaps these economic and strategic interests are 
the ones that allow us to answer the question that we posed at the on the, for the first presentation about the Communist Party, the Moroccan Communist Party, and also about the question related to the, what the so-called uh, positive neutrality and is imposed by economic inter- and strategic interests. And we're not going to turn away from uh, the North Africa. We'll stay within North Africa, with North Africa. And now, uh, Dr. Abdul Hayy Ali Qasim will rush Libyan, Russia Libyan relations, prospects in the wake of the 2011 evolution. Uh, Mr. Abdul Hayy Ali Qasim Saleh is a lecturer in public law at Sana'a University and he has worked as a researcher at the Yemeni Center for Strategic Studies and he has uh, many academic articles and publications. He obtained his uh, PhD in public law from the University of Malik Abdul Malik Saadi in Morocco. Uh, so the floor is yours, uh, <coughs> Mr. Abdul Hay. Good evening. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, I would like to thank you all for uh, taking part in this conference. And I would like to thank this promising uh, a scientific uh, center uh, uh, that we would like to see as a hub uh, for uh, scientific studies uh, within a nation that uh, seeks to know more and uh, uh, acquire more knowledge. I would like to thank all the researchers within the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. The topic uh, of uh, this uh, study uh, is uh, the Russo-Libyan uh, relations prospects in the wake of the 2011 revolution. In this paper, I try to clarify the prospects of the relationship between Russia and Libya in the wake of the revolution and the changes and the priorities of Russia and the region. I would like to examine or to study a pragmatic approach. And let us start with a question. Uh, are the relationship, uh, the relations between Russia and Libya after Gaddafi and in the wake of the revolution will remain as strong as before with all the privileges or are the changes uh, in the scene in uh, Libya uh, will impose changes uh, at the level of the relationship, especially when it comes to the security aspects of this relationship. Uh, the paper I'm presenting was founded on the fact that the revolution in Libya and the position in Russia uh, are, are interlinked. There are a number of political, security, and economic considerations uh, that uh, influence this relationship. However, the privileges uh, uh, that were uh, within the, uh, under the umbrella of this uh, relationship uh, were no longer are no longer uh, there, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to the uh, position against the revolution of the Libyan population. Uh, f- in a, f- uh, at this level, uh, the decision uh, of the Russian leaders uh, did not uh, uh, help to bridge uh, the gap. So, uh, we are going to try to study the new system. A new uh, system in uh, Libya. And uh, uh, the Russians are trying to cope with the changes. In order to see the prospects for the future, we should talk about history, first of all. The relationship, the diplomatic relationship between Russia and Libya in 1956 uh, uh, were cold and uh, witnessed some marginalization. However, there was a dramatic change after the visit of Gaddafi to Moscow in 1976. And in Libya, there are, uh, or there has been several of uh, Soviet experts and Libyan students benefited from the knowledge in the colleges and universities of the Soviet Union. Gaddafi also armed its uh, military based on the support of the Russian uh, superpower. 
And uh, Libya has always uh, become an opportunity or has always been an opportunity uh, as a market for the military exports of uh, Russia, especially with the declining economy. And Libya was one of the solutions to the crisis, uh, to the economic crisis in uh, Russia. The Russia of Putin did not take the second position. This is why they try to reconcile the uh, external or the foreign policy with the internal policy. They focused on the interests of the Russian uh, uh, power or state. Uh, they adopted tactics uh, to seize every opportunity and uh, to avoid any conflicts or any clashes uh, that are against their interests. Gaddafi noticed that that was the policy, and when he discovered that Russia was no longer this uh, ally that accepts uh, uh, his political adventures, especially after the fall of Saddam Hussein, uh, Gaddafi uh, started to find solutions to his problems with the West based on the deal of Lockerbie. And now, the February Revolution and its repercussions on the relations. Libya, similarly to other countries, was not influenced by external uh, politics except for the influence of the uh, of Russia. So the relationship between Russia and Libya was like a constant test. After the revolution that started in February, the test was difficult. Russia couldn't, uh, couldn't save or rescue Gaddafi, and the West wanted to oust the Gaddafi regime. Russia was based on its interest uh, when it comes to determining the tactics. It does not take into consideration the Allies. Its cooperation with the United States, France, Germany, and the UK is huge and cannot be compared with the cooperation with Gaddafi. Therefore, Russia could not take an adventure uh, in order to protect uh, the uh, criminal that was uh, Gaddafi. And here I would like to, uh, to sequence a number of uh, indicators regarding the Russian position vis-a-vis -vis the revolution. First of all, Russia lost a weapons deal to export, of course, to Russian weapons that was signed in to, uh, uh, 2010, in addition to several deals with the previous regime. The position of uh, Russia and Libya was based on the interests, in summary, and uh, it was uh, pragmatic, it was flexible, based on the indicators of uh, the situations on the ground. If uh, the tyrants uh, side wins, the uh, revolution does not serve the interest of the country. And if the revolution uh, wins, Russia respects the philosophy of international relations based on the non-intervention. So the Arab Spring uh, has not, uh, is not over yet in order to study its uh, full influence. Al Jubeli, during his visit uh, to Russia, said that Libya wants to open a new page uh, with its relationship and, uh, with Russia. Uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov uh, also said uh, that it is necessary to revive this relationship. And Mikhail uh, Nivarvarov uh, uh, also uh, was explaining during a meeting the position of Russia vis-a-vis -vis the revolution. And uh, although the explanation was a bit different than the reality, regarding the prospects uh, of the economic and military relations, I think that uh, the uh, odds are, are uh, not that good in favor of uh, the uh, reviving of the economic uh, relation. 
And despite uh, uh, the fact that Russia was keen to continue uh, uh, with this relationship and uh, to keep on uh, exporting uh, goods uh, to Libya, the revolution has imposed new changes and Russia should uh, study the new changes in order to overcome the obstacles and seize the opportunity in order to restructure its relationship with Arab countries and Russia needs to do so at the political and security level. The Russian position vis-a-vis -vis the revolution was not uh, supportive and uh, the Russian position vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in Syria and Yemen favoring Iran and the region against the security of the region should also be taken into consideration, especially Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries and Turkey. Of course, uh, these have negative impacts on the relationship between Russia and Libya. At the political level, the uh, structure or the nature of the political regime will determine the nature of this relationship. If the military uh, goes back uh, to go back to their uh, military camps or from their military camps to power, this might not serve it. However, if we have like a civil or civil parties uh, or civil society parties uh, ruling uh, the country, the relationship might be subject to interests uh, of the two countries. As to the security, uh, the level of energy, Russia bases its uh, uh, policy on gas and oil. And uh, of course, uh, a country like Libya is important uh, because it is an oil exporting country and it's got um, important reserve. Russia has today a very tough test when it comes to dealing with the geography of the Middle East and uh, it needs to determine the future of the relationship in order to restructure the tools and the methods to deal with a post-revolution Arab world. And uh, Russia wants to play a major role uh, at the international level. It is very hard uh, to uh, determine uh, the future of the relationship between Russia and Libya. However, the privileges of Russia and Libya in the past are no longer valid, despite all the optimistic views. Any Russia between Libya and Russia is ruled by security, political, and economic uh, factors, and uh, the, these factors will determine the relationship between Russia and Arab countries in general, and the uh, regional uh, conflict with Iran, the support of uh, Russia to Iran, just uh, hampers the development of the relationship between Russia and the Arab world. There should be a balance between the relationship with Iran and with the Arab world, and of course, Libya is part of the Arab world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abdel Hay, for respecting uh, the time and for this uh, presentation, this valuable presentation. You have a shed light about the era of Gaddafi and uh, the post-revolution uh, era. The position of Russia was uh, one, unchanged, and you have to told us that it is a pragmatic uh, a position. It is based on uh, security and political factors that were taken into consideration. And the question to be asked based on the three papers so far, what do we want from Russia? It is a state that uh, takes its interests into consideration and uh, similarly to other countries. What do we want from Russia? Let us move to the east of Africa, to Somalia in particular. Mr. or Dr. Mohammed Ahmed Sheikh Ali will be telling us about the Somali 
Russian relations, past, present, and future prospects of uh, this relationship. Mr. Mohammed uh, Ahmed uh, Sheikh Ali is Professor of Political Science, Faculty of Economics and Political and Management Science, International University of Africa. His research, research interests are in the field of politics, civil society, religion, development, and Africa's international relations. He has authored and contributed to five books. He obtained a PhD in African Studies uh, from the Institute for African and Asian Studies, Khartoum University, in 2000. Four, and he promised me that he was going to stick to the 15 minutes allocated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, dear colleagues, and the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. As uh, Mr. Chairman said, um, I will be talking about the Russian Somali relation and uh, the past, present, and future prospects. First and foremost, before moving to the paper, I would like to go back to what was uh, said yesterday by Dr. Marwan Kaplan, uh, who said that most of the papers were based on Western studies. And when we talk about Somalia and the relations between Russia and uh, Somalia, this is in fact the case because nine months ago, there was a dialogue with the Russian expert and the uh, expert in the Somali language, Dr. George Kapps, who learned Somali in uh, Moscow 50 years ago before having written uh, uh, Somalian. And Alexander Shatovsky was uh, his professor. So uh, when he was uh, uh, discussing in 2006, uh, uh, he said uh, that, uh, unfortunately, my professor immigrated to, to the United States to teach Russian literature in the south of California. Uh, therefore, there were no studies from Somalia or from Russia. This morning, one of the colleagues said that uh, the studies are written in Russia uh, and we do not understand the Russian. These studies, anyway, are considered Western studies. And they do not take into consideration everything regarding the Russian-Somali uh, relationship. The relationship started between Russia and uh, Somalia in the Soviet era, post-World War II, and the Soviet Union became member of the four superpowers who that, that, that wanted to determine the fate of uh, Eritrea, Libya, and the south of Somalia. Since then, there was a relationship between Russia and Somalia. And uh, some sources say that the informal relationship started through intellectuals and parties in Somalia from the left wing back then. And these intellectuals and the left wing parties in the late 1950s talked, uh, corresponded with the uh, Soviet Union through Yemen, Abdullah Asnaj, the Yemeni politician says that he was the link between the intellectuals and the United or the Soviet Union. The relationship between Somalia and uh, or, uh, the uh, Soviet Union was based on the interest of the Soviet Union in this region. Uh, the Soviet Union wanted to break the U.S. and the West hegemony in this region. It was a colonial region. Uh, colonized by France and Italy before becoming affiliated with the United States. Uh, Somalia has a strategic uh, position uh, near the water passageways close to the oil producing countries and the trade exchange route. A Somal istakalla fi janubihi min Italy. 
So Somalia uh, was unified in uh, the July of 1960. Somalia uh, wanted to build its uh, governmental agencies, increase its productivity, reforming its economic activities, the industries, uh, the hospitals, the services. Uh, Somalia was counting on the support of the West. However, there was no support. This is why Somalia looked toward the Soviet Union in order to be supported to start this new era. And in October 1960, the diplomatic relationship started between the Soviet Union and Somalia. Moscow opened an um, embassy in Mogadishu in October 1960, two months later in December. The employees at the embassy became 300 employees, so we could see the interest of the Soviet Union and the region. In March 1961, there was a good faith uh, uh, envoy uh, to assess the situation in Somalia and offer aid. In May 1961, the president of Somalia visited uh, the leadership in Moscow and uh, was greeted. And uh, there was cooperation uh, from the part of the Soviet Union. In January or in June, uh, there was uh, an economic agreement and a cultural agreement uh, that resulted in building uh, hospitals, schools, physicians, educators, infrastructure, ports, establishing uh, dairy product, uh, fisheries, and uh, meat uh, industries. In 1962, the president of Somalia visited the United States of America and met President Kennedy and discussed the support, the economic support, the military uh, support of Somalia and uh, tackled the issue of building the Somali military. President Kennedy totally refused uh, to support Somalia because President Kennedy thought that Somalia wanted to recover uh, the territories under Ethiopia, Kenya, and Djibouti, uh, French territory back then. The the uh, Constitution of Somalia stipulated that the government of Somalia had to recover uh, these uh, areas. An agreement was signed in November uh, 1963 between, United, uh, between the Soviet Union and Somalia to build uh, a Somali military of 20,000 soldiers with full training and uh, weapon supply. This uh, security agreement triggered uh, some uh, fears in the region, especially with the United States of America. There were some clashes between Somalia and Kenya and Somal Somalia and Ethiopia. Ethiopia then signed a military agreement with Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania. This relationship continued. However, it had negative repercussions on the political scene of Somalia. When the prime minister was in dispute with the president, a new prime minister was appointed. Abdul Razak Haj Hussein, the second prime minister, uh, had Western tendencies and was not in favor of the relationship with the Soviet Union. Ali Abdullah was not uh, totally in favor of uh, this relationship. However, it did not influence uh, the uh, aid from the Soviet Union to Somalia. These, this assistance continued. Abdelaziz Sharmaki, uh, the former prime minister, became president of Somalia after the presidential elections. And uh, he appointed a new prime minister, Mohammed Ibrahim Ayal, uh, who had also Western tendencies. The West considered that Prime Minister Ayal would restitute the balance uh, that was uh, lost, uh, that the U.S. lost in the region. 
the Prime Minister reconcil uh, uh, issued a reconciliation with uh, the different leaders in Somalia and then visited uh, the United States of America. However, because of the uh, huge number of intellectuals uh, who studied in the Soviet uh, Union uh, and because of the corruption within the government and because of the changes uh, after the elections and the reactions of uh, the Somalis who thought uh, that uh, uh, the prime minister should not have offered concessions uh, to Kenya and Ethiopia. All of this led to the assassination of the president in October 1969. And then there was a military coup, and uh, th th there was a new president. And then the Soviet Union once again found um, uh, this kind of uh, welcome, um, the reception after losing its allies in Mali in 1972. A new minister of the Soviet defense, uh, minister of defense, came to Mogadishu and. Uh, signed in a military pact, military agreement, um, whereby Somalia had military support, and then this uh, comprehensive agreement was signed covering military, industrial, and cultural aspects. And then after that, there came the war witnessed by Somalia. Somalia was building an army to regain its lost territory, but the Soviet Union did not mean to support Somalia, did not mean that Somalia would engage in wars with Ethiopia. However, it could not control or manage the disagreements in the region, and then the problem ended with the uh, Ogaden War, uh, 67, and then the relations were cut off between Soviet Union and the S Somalia, and then, which took a long time, each side um, after 1985-86 to restore the normal relations between the two sides, but what happened with the Somali, um, Somalia and the collapse of the Soviet Union did not allow the two sides to resume normal relations. Nine, uh, 2007, Somalia had an ambassador in Moscow and uh, who pointed out, who referred to some in a potential in Russian investments in Somalia and indicated that there was uh, and then a sa satellite station in and Afghanistan will be transferred to Somalia uh, to, uh, to, by the year 2050. There will be Russian investments in the energy sector, minerals, training of security forces. And the Russia contributed to, to uh, anti uh, counter uh, piracy uh, activity in the sea and expressed its satisfaction. Uh, with the um, American uh, attacks on the Shabab movement uh, sites. And last year, uh, March 2014, the Russian uh, ambassador submitted his credentials to the Somali president, indicating that he, Russia would help Somalia in the security sector and enhancing stability and development. However, the Somali um, ambassador in Moscow um, uh, indicated during the Georgian crisis that Somalia uh, acknowledged uh, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which was denied by the Somali foreign ministry. When the Russian uh, minister submitted his credentials in March last year, two days ago, the, the uh, Somali foreign minister issued a statement saying that Somalia respects the Ukrainian sovereignty and expressed its regret for Russian, uh, what they call Russian aggression against um, Ukraine and expressed its willingness to mediate in the efforts, uh, diplomatic effort between um, Russia and Ukraine. All of these perhaps were actions that would actually try to um, uh, affect the relation, new, uh, newly developed relation between Somalia and uh, Russia. Um, in brief, um, to conclude, there is a prospect for the relation between Russia and Somalia. Russia expressed through its ambassador and through uh, Russian representatives in the London Conference in 2012 and 2013 expressed its willingness to support Somalia in its stability, building its forces, um, and uh, providing support in fighting uh, piracy 
and also fighting the Shabab movement because the same problem uh, was uh, faced by Russia in the south. Um, and there is an opportunity at the moment for both sides, Somalia and Russia, to develop and enhance bilateral relations in the light of some agricultural and industrial projects uh, financed and supported by Russian expertise. The Somali army was mostly um, trained and equipped with uh, Russian uh, military equipment, uh, the cadres as well, um, military w f which were active in the Somali scene. But there were challenges, on the other hand, represented with the uh, Western and Russian competition and Somalia's total reliance on the West and the concerns of the neighboring countries and the fears for the development about the development of a possible development of um, Somali army threatening their security and stability once again. And if there is somebody who could read, have an accurate reading on the relation between the two sides, that would be a great opportunity for developing those relations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed Ahmed Sheikh, for this uh, valuable presentation which um, describes some of the features of the uh, Russian presence in East Africa, which would um, contribute to deeper knowledge of the Russian, uh, the relation between Russia and the re countries of the region. Thank you to all the speakers. And now I'll open the floor for discussion. For, approx for about 20 minutes, divided between the uh, questioners and the speakers. Go ahead. Uh, in the name of God, they're beneficent, they're merciful. I'm very happy with the what we heard, what I enjoyed uh, particularly. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Ragi, who talked about the uh, Dr. Ali, who talked about the relation between Somalia and Russia. Russia, Somalia is the puzzle, the land of suffering and future as well. In fact, I was really surprised by the chronology of events in the Somali-Russian relations. I did not have in mind. Don't think that Somalia uh, gained such uh, attention or importance from the uh, Russia insofar as it suffered from the uh, the political turmoil and the and the Italian and British and uh, imperialism and then what we could could be called perhaps uh, American uh, imperialism or American criminality in the Somali and took Somalia back by 70 years and created a host of problems in Somalia from which Somalia will suffer a lot for a long time to come. And this awareness of the chronology, diplomatic chronology, makes us really optimistic. It's a cause for optimism, really, that Somalia for me was Oh, and still is a land, a country that's suffering and suffering. And after what we heard just now, we realized that Somalia, they're, they're not, the people not in, realized the internal problems in Somalia and could actually bring Somalia out to the natural space, uh, to the peaceful life. I hope that these ideas will be crowned uh, with a program, practical program or project, uh, either through the African scene or the uh, organization of Islamic cooperation, uh, because Somalia is a basket, economic basket, if you like, and a strategic uh, position for the Islamic and Arab world. Thank you very much for this um, uh, excellent presentation. OK. Go ahead. Okay, Her Excellency, go ahead. The floor is yours. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you. I would like to thank all the colleagues who have spoken and Dr. Mohammed. Uh, in fact, the Soviet Somali relations at the time, as uh, Dr. Ali indicated, happened after all the prospects, all the horizons were actually blocked for Somalia. All the Western countries that refused to build any force, a security, Somali security force, 
uh, except uh, the police. And even when Somalia uh, uh, had support for the Somali police, the Americans uh, turned them like a Western uh, West Germany, which was semi-occupied by Western powers. Uh, nevertheless, in spite of those relations, there were challenges, even at that time, because even the African countries uh, thought that the, the foreign body, thought of Somalia as a foreign body in the Africa due to the components and the structure of Somalia and the historical developments of Somalia as a Muslim people, uh, entirely Muslim, Sunni, and there were confrontations in the African continent, the only country where the historical confrontation between the Christians represented by Ethiopia, uh, Muslims uh, represented in, by Somalia at the time, even when the uh, Soviet president um, in 1974 and visited a number of African countries, including Angola, I mean uh, Mozambique, uh, in Tanzania, uh, Mozambique uh, trained uh, the Somalia trained the Mozambican uh, uh, forces, but all of them used to talk against this Somalia. And Nereri as well, who was the president of Tanzania, used to say that Somalia, with oh, the danger, uh, the threat in uh, African Horn, even the Soviet Union looked at it from that point in spite of its support for Somalia and support for the Somali army, which became the third strongest army in the continent in the 70s. But despite the, when the dispute between Ethiopia and Somalia, the Soviets were allied with the Ethiopians and supported the Ethiopian army as well as East Germany and southern Yemen as well. Uh, these were the challenges of the time, but the reality was that the Soviet Union was one of the main countries that supported Somalia after the independence, not only in terms of the army, there are doctors and engineers who graduated from Soviet universities at the time, and some of them until this very moment are still there. And the doctor mentioned also other institutions, not only in the military sphere, but there were uh, more than 4,000 uh, ad uh, Soviet advisors in Somalia until the relations worsened and then uh, Soviet Union was outside uh, Somalia before the breakout of the war. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Any intervention? Okay. The person who is concerned with the question then who would be answering them is Dr. Muhammad Sheikh Ali. If you have any comments, unless you have any any comments, we adjourn. Okay. In the name of God, the benefits of the Messenger Muhammad Ali Ibrahim. I think these countries uh, in the past at the time of the Soviet Union, there was a conflict to encircle the region, the strategic region, where the uh, water uh, passages and the oil and the Soviet Union had influence in Syria, Libya, and Ethiopia, as well as South Yemen. So it was in Somalia for a while. The, the conflict was always to complete this circle, this encirclement of the region. So there was a, a conflict uh, with this Sudan and Chad. Chad, there were several attempts by, by the regime in Libya, which was allied with the Eastern um, system uh, and the Sudan as well, after Numeri became allied with the liberal movement or the liberal, liberal West, they were engaged in a conflict in Chad. And I think all those countries entered uh, Somalia and there was engaged in the conflict to encircle the, uh, the oil-rich uh, region and where the waterways as well are.
Thank you very much. We'll... Oh, we didn't hear that. 